Well, this morning I'm continuing the message series called Taking the Next Step. And this series will focus upon taking the next step in your relationship with God. And our key verse for this series comes from Paul's words about spiritual maturity in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So spiritual maturity means becoming like Christ in everything we do. So this series will take a close look at eight steps that every Christian needs to take to become more like Christ. And so far, we've talked about six of those steps. The first is reading the Bible. Spend at least five minutes every day putting God's Word into your mind. The second next step is praying to God. Spend at least five minutes every day talking with your Heavenly Father. The next step is something we call a daily quiet time with God. And this step combines the first two steps as you connect with God through Bible reading and prayer. The fourth next step is connecting with Christians. Join a Bible study group or a ministry team and share life with your fellow Christians. The fifth next step is worship. And you can worship God every day by giving Him your attention, your affection, and your abilities. The sixth next step is serving God. And God has given you gifts and abilities that you can use right now to make a difference in this world for Him. God has a ministry that's just right for you. Today we're going to move forward and talk about that seventh next step. And that step is giving. What talks, burns a hole in your pocket, doesn't grow on trees, and can't buy you love? You got it. Money. You think about money. You work for money. You spend money. You save money. You give money. You get stressed because of money. Your relationship with money isn't something that you can just brush aside as unnecessary or unimportant. At the same time, money doesn't have a life. It can't act on its own. Uh, it can't do good deeds. It can't do bad deeds. Basically, it's neither good nor bad. Money can only do what you tell it to do. So what about you? What do you do with your money? What does your money do with you? Where do you look to find wisdom and, and advice on how to handle money? Did you know that the Bible has more to say about money than just about any other subject? There are about 500 verses in the Bible about prayer. Less than 500 about faith, but over 2,000 verses about money and possessions. Over one half of Jesus' parables involve the subject of money. Today, we're going to just talk about one aspect of money, and that is giving. God loves you, and He wants you to love Him in return. In the same way, God has given to you, and He wants you to give back to Him. God wants you to take some of your resources and offer them back to Him. So, what does God expect when it comes to giving? How much of my money does God want? When the offering plate was passed just a few minutes ago, what motivated you to give the amount that you gave? Well, if you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to open it to the Old Testament book called Malachi, chapter 3. Malachi is the very last book in the Old Testament. And today I want us to take a look at what God says about giving in Malachi, chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. 
Beginning with verse 7, Malachi writes, Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Money is a test. The way we handle money reveals a lot of things about us. It's not just a matter of dollars and cents. It's a matter of the heart. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So today I want us to consider four tests of giving. Your practice of giving reveals four things about you. So can you pass these four tests of giving? Number one, giving is a test of ownership. Malachi talks in chapter 3, verse 8, about robbing God. The people were handling their money in such a way that they were robbing God. They were not putting God in his rightful position when it came to money. So what is God's rightful position when it comes to money? The test of ownership says God owns it all. God is the owner of all your possessions, your house, your car, your television, all of your investments. Everything you have is owned by God. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So if you belong to Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you belong to God. And if you belong to God, then everything you have belongs to God. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably heard about tithing. Tithing is the biblical principle that 10% of everything that we earn belongs to God. But tithing doesn't mean that we can do whatever we desire with the other 90%. The idea isn't that 10% belongs to God and 90% belongs to me. No, the true biblical principle is 100% belongs to God. And yes, God does want us to take 10% and give to Him to support His work. But God also wants to be included in what we do with the other 90%. So the test of ownership means... God owns it all. Martin Luther wrote about three areas of salvation that take place when a man or a woman becomes a Christian. Uh, number one, it was the salvation of the heart. Number two, the salvation of the mind. And number three, the salvation of the pocketbook. And the most difficult of the three, according to Luther, is the last one. The salvation of the pocketbook. Putting God in charge of your finances. Now, if God owns our money, then where does that leave us? Well, the Bible says that we're to be stewards or managers. Our job is to manage our money for God who owns it all. And what matters to God isn't how much you have, but what you do with what you do have. Our job is to be a faithful manager. And that means that every spending decision is a spiritual decision. 
And that includes buying a car, taking a vacation, purchasing groceries, paying the monthly bills. We're to manage the money that God has given to us. And God must be included in every financial transaction. So the way to pass the test of ownership is not to ask the question, God, what do you want me to do with my money? No, we should be asking, God, what do you want me to do with your money? Number two, giving is a test of gratitude. The Israelites in Malachi's day were forgetting about God. They were going about their daily task and not even thinking about God. And Malachi reminds them in verse 7 that they've been turning away from God's decrees. So they need to turn back to God and remember all the things that God has already done for them. It was important for them, and it's equally important for us to remember that even the money we earn is a gift from God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18 says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God. It is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Yes, you earned your paycheck, but God gave you the ability to do the job. Yes, you bought the home uh, from all the money that you saved and invested. But God gave you the ability to think ahead and to plan. Yes, you worked hard for your money. But God gave you the health and the ability to produce that wealth. So we should give to God out of gratitude for all that he has done for us. God gave us the job. God gave us the ability to do the job. God gave us the wisdom to manage money and take care of our family. And God has done something even greater that should cause us to be even more grateful. When God looked at the sinful condition of men and women, he made an outrageous decision. God could have judged the world. God could have blown up the world and started over. But God did something remarkable. He sent his son to die for our wrongs. Jesus went to the cross and paid a huge bill for all of my sins and all of your sins. And when you understand what Jesus did for you, something inside you responds with gratitude. And out of that gratitude, you want to give. You no longer say, well, I suppose I should do my fair share in giving to God. No. Once you understand the cross, your gratitude rises to a higher level. And you start to think, with all that Jesus has done for me, how could I not give? I mean, Jesus gave to me. And the best way for me to be like Jesus is to give back to him. That's how you pass the test of gratitude. Number three, giving is a test of obedience. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 talks about bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse. And this is the person who says, God, you tell me what you want me to give, and whatever it is, I'll give it, because I want to be obedient to you. Many Christians today continue to practice what's taught in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And there God is asking us to bring a 10% slice of our earnings and give it back to Him. So the obedient giver brings the tithe, the 10%, joyfully and consistently. The obedient giver 
doesn't question it, doesn't fudge around it, doesn't compromise it. The Bible says to give 10%, so they give 10%. Some people may ask, what will happen to my finances if I start tithing? Well, the last part of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 says, Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't even have enough room for it. It's almost as if God is daring you to give. You give 10%, and God says that he'll make the 90% go just as far, if not farther. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 read like this. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. People who've practiced tithing for years give a testimony over and over again that you can't outgive God. The more they give, the more God blesses them. So to pass the test of obedience, you must give 10% to God and then trust Him to take care of you. Number four. Giving is a test of love. Because the Israelites in Malachi's day were not putting God first, other things like personal wealth and money were taking God's place. And when it comes to money, we'll either worship wealth or we'll worship with our wealth. We can't have it both ways. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Our giving reveals what's most important to us. Oh, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. God gives to us because He loves us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Giving is what love does. And because God loves the world, God gives to the world. When I think about the cross and the fact that Jesus took upon himself every wrong thing that I've ever done, sometimes that just overwhelms me. And when the full extent of what Jesus did for me sweeps over me, I sometimes begin to think, I can't believe he would actually do that for me. And when I have thoughts like that, it's as though God whispers in my ear and says, love for you made me do that. Love made me do that. You give to God because you love God. It's your relationship with God and your love for God that causes you to give. And Paul expresses it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You give to God because you love God. One day Jesus was standing by the temple treasury, and he was watching people as they were giving. A widow approaches and drops in two coins the last two coins that she owns. She walks away from there, trusting that somehow she'll find food. And I can only imagine someone stopping her on the way home that day 
and asking her why she would do such a thing. I mean, why would you give those two coins when those were your last two coins? And I can just hear her respond. This may not make any sense to you, but love made me do it. To pass the test of love, we should not ask the question, how much can I get? We should ask the question, how much can I give? Our desire to have should never surpass our desire to give. Because we give because we love God. And there may come a time in your life when God prompts you to give more than you've ever given to support His work. God may lead you to say, I have all that I need and so much more. So I'm going to take a chunk of this extra and I'm going to give it in support of God's work. And the only explanation I have for giving such a large gift is because love made me do it. If you're a believer... In Jesus Christ. God wants you to take the next step by giving to Him. Pass the ownership test by understanding that God owns it all. Include God in all your money matters. Pass the gratitude test by recognizing that everything you have comes from God. So give back to Him from a grateful heart. Pass the obedience test by giving exactly what God tells you to give. And then trust that God will honor your obedience by taking care of you. Then pass the love test by giving freely to your heavenly Father. Just give out of your heart and give openly to Him. And when people find out that you're such a generous giver, I'm sure they're going to ask, what made you do that? You know, why are you so generous with your money? And you'll respond by saying, love made me do it. I love God, and I love my church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you set the extreme example when it comes to giving. And it's the most famous verse in the Bible, and just about everybody in this country knows it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Father, thank you for that example. Because of your great love for us, you gave to us. And you gave your Son that our sins might be forgiven, and that we might have life everlasting by believing in you. Father, part of growing in our faith is to learn to give back to you, to, to have a heart of love that is willing to give. And Father, wherever we are today, when it comes to giving, Father, just speak to us about where we need to go. Where's the next step for us when it comes to giving to you? And may it be true of us, as it says in the Bible, that we give generously, we give graciously, we give cheerfully because of all that you've given to us. Thank you, God, for giving, for setting the example. May we follow you and become like Christ in giving back to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.